Hello, everyone. Welcome to Research Hub. This is Yal Hakmunim, the founder of Research Hub. And thank you so much for supporting Research Hub until now. So with this video, we are going to start a new playlist, which we are going to call Dissemination Research Results. So in this playlist, we are going to upload a series of videos, which are mainly conference paper presentations, but also we are going to upload summaries of journal articles published in different journals. And most of the videos are going to be between five to 10 minutes. So you can consider these videos as video abstracts. And most of the videos will focus more on the methodology section. Initially, we are going to upload videos from the research hub team members and research hub network, but you can also submit your videos to be uploaded in this dissemination series playlist. But for that, send us your video, which should be between five to 10 minutes, plus minus two minutes, that's okay. Send us your video at support at the right researchhub.org. So the best way would be that you upload your video in Dropbox or Google Drive and send us the link over email. And we'll review the video. If it meets quality criteria, we are going to upload it in this playlist. And of course, below the video in the description, all credit will be given to you. And also we are going to put the links of the papers that are covered in the video. So which will which will also increase the visibility of the published journal articles. So in the first video, we are going to start with one of my paper, which is about forecasting using space estate models. This paper has already been published um, and you will find the link of the published version below in the video description. So for now, enjoy the video and see you again. So my name is Yol Hakmunim. I'm currently Associate Professor of Maritime Logistics at the University of Southeastern Norway. And I'll be chairing this session on shipping markets modeling and analysis. And thanks to all of you for your patience to wait, for waiting with us for joining this session. So we have about 100 minutes for the whole session and we have four papers. So I suggest that we take about 25 minutes, maybe a little less because we have now spent some time. So maybe a little less. So we, I, I suggest that we present for like 15 to 20 minutes and then we take like five, about five minutes for discussion and, and, and feedback. And interestingly, the first presentation is my own. So I will start. So my presentation title is um, is container freight forecasting and recursive horizons improving forecast accuracy using state space t beds model. So in this study, what I do is I, I forecast container freight rate and as a proxy for freight rates, I choose CCFI, China Containerized Freight Index. And I forecast it using three univariate model, seasonal univariate models actually. And also I tried two things, one is uh, re-estimation of the model, and also I check for non-linearity of the time series. So I will tell you in detail when we move on. I guess all of you can see my screen, right? Yeah, no problem. Great. So first of all, why forecast? And when we talk about forecast, you know, I just pick these numbers here. I was searching with forecasting terms in the Mar Maritime Economics book by Stockford. And you see forecasting appears 172 times. And actually in total, these terms, forecasting terms, appears about 452 to 54 times, 454 times. So it's about 800 page book. So that means more or less in every one and a half page forecast, the word forecast or forecast related words appear at this one. So that kind of already tells us why it's important. But to tell a little bit more, it's, Forecasting of freight rates has useful implications for the ship owners and shipping lines because of because they want to understand the profitability and profitability of the companies or ship owners are associated highly with the freight rates. And also based on that, they make investment decisions. So that's why the forecast of freight rates are important for them. For shippers, sometimes waiting a week or two, especially for the large shippers, if they can forecast that, okay, to which the freight rates will be low, so when they have large volumes, then they can save quite a lot of money. Shipbuilders, they want to understand the new building orders coming up. And when the freight rates are high, normally we get more orders. So that's why it's kind of 
uh, not directly, but indirectly of importance for them. And then the bankers who finance the ships, and they want to understand if the ship owners, if the, if the borrowers can pay the money and which is associated with the freight rates. And also some of the shipbuilders, they also uh, finance uh, shipping projects. So for both shipbuilders and, and bankers uh, who finance and shipping projects, for them also it's important. Also for port authorities and other uh, players, for instance, governments, when they provide some subsidy to different shipping segments, for them also it, it, it has some importance. So now, as I mentioned, I focus CCFI, China Containerized Freight Index, but why? The first reason it, it is the second most influ influential freight index after the dry bulk freight index, then it is audited. So there are two or three, three other uh, container freight indexes uh, but they are not audited uh, or either they're not edited or they're not long enough to do some uh, time series analysis. And then CCFI is also reported by 22 renowned liner shipping companies. And also it looks into the freight, it, 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 it captures the freight uh, between, the, yeah, they have many routes, but mostly from Chinese ports, 10 Chinese ports to other markets. And China is one of the hub of containerized trade flows. So that's why it's, uh, I think it's important. That's why. And then I compare three models, but why do we compare models? We compare models because we want to understand if one model is good enough, then which one? So compared to other models, which one is doing good? Or maybe should we compare two, three models for this performance of two, three models? And then how should we compare? Should we take weighted average? Should we take single average? Actually, in this study, I took only single average uh, because I wanted to keep it simple. simple. And uh, I wanted to do in-depth analysis of one time series. That's why I tried to keep the other things a bit simpler here. And then why univariate models? So I picked this sentence from a stuff force book. So here we said that he said that uh, the problem for many time forecasters is that there are important aspects of the future maritime industry that are not predictable. So normally if we do multivariate model, we will need some exploratory variables, uh, which could be the GDP, which could be technology, which could be other related uh, maritime variables. And often those are not really predictable, including like situations like this. Now we have the COVID-19. So these are like uh, large scale variables, which we, macroeconomic variables, which we cannot really predict. So that's why Normally, one of the approach could be to just let the data speak for itself. We, we look into one time series and see what can we take from there. And also, normally, one, some of the exploratory variables for freight rates should be demand and supply related variables, and which are often not available on weekly level or monthly level. Even if they are available on monthly level, they are not available real time. So, for instance, the demand, the container trade demand for this month will come after two months. We don't really have it now at the moment, but maybe in the future uh, with the AIS data, maybe we will be able to forecast it real time or we will have it available real time. I'm not sure if we already have it, but I think we will have it in the future, but not at the moment. And then I do model re-estimation. I will explain it a little bit more what I mean by that. But normally the idea behind this is that when we have a new data point available, following efficient market hypothesis, normally it should reflect in the market, okay? So when we have a new data point available, maybe we should forecast, we should estimate the model again with the training data. We should maybe estimate the model again and use new parameters to forecast the next data point. And also there could be some structural breaks. In this study, I didn't test for a structural breaks, but uh, normally if I just keep forecasting every time, if I, if I just keep re-estimating the model every time there is a new data point from the forecasting perspective, uh, if we have a structural breaks, it should not be a problem at all. It should be already accounted there because we are re-estimating the model all the time. And just to give some overview of, just to give some overview of the literature. So here uh, we'll see many forecasting applications in the bulk shipping perspective. Uh, starting from Culinane, 1992 study, uh, and there are many more. But in container shipping, there are not 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 many, I would say. So the first study was by one of the first study was by Professor Mayfing Liu uh, in 2009, which was a good time to start uh, forecasting freight rates for container shipping industry because 
the market suddenly went down and also um, the European conference systems for ports calling at the uh, European Union, that was also canceled. So after that, actually after 2008 and 2009, the freight rates of container uh, shipping became a bit more volatile compared to before. So I think that was a good time to start. And also there were some more studies with Nelson and then we started doing studies, me and my colleague, Dr. Shram, we started uh, doing forecasting studies in 2017, and then we have done a few more. Uh, I also did some more studies with Professor Duru. So here we can see the moles that has been used. And one of the thing here is that most of these models did not account for seasonality. I'm criticizing my own previous work. <laughs> okay, so uh, we should have looked for seasonality in this time series, and which we haven't done. We, you know, these models, um, they did not really account for seasonality. Another point is we didn't know if the time series of, of container freight rates are um, nonlinear or not. Most of these models are linear models, except for ANN. Sometimes system dynamics could be nonlinear, but uh, most of the models that has been used were linear models. So I wanted in this study, I wanted to look into seasonality and nonlinearity dynamics of the container freight, freight market. So normally in time series study, when we start with the study, the first thing we do is, one of the first things I, I would say, to be on the safe side, is that we look for station already. We have these two tests, uh, augmented Dickey Fuller test and uh, Philip Perrin test. You can see that I reported the results. So on first difference log operator, our time series becomes stationary. So we could proceed with that. By the way, I should mention that my data sample is from January 2010 to December 2018, until the end of December 2018. So that's my whole data set. And for cross-validation purpose, I divided the training data into two periods. So one is from January 2010 to December 2016. So it is 366 weeks. And using this training sample, I was forecasting uh, the whole year, the 12 months of 2017. And then in the second uh, window, se second in sample window, I had January 2010 to December 2017, and I was forecasting the December, uh, the, the whole year of 2018, the 52 weeks of 2018. Okay, so that's uh, that I should mention. So stationary is good after uh, first difference operator, it's, it works. Also, as I mentioned, I wanted to look into the seasonality. So I created this polar, uh, polar seasonal plot. Here you can see one, two, 52, these are the weeks. And for each year, the data is presented here and you can see the legions here. So normally from here, what we can see is that normally in the early months of January and February, the freight rates are normally low for most of them. Then from March, that's because of the Chinese New Year. And after that, from March, it tries, it increases a little bit. Sometimes there are abnormal increases also, like in, in this case here, it's 2012. Okay, and then normally it will be kind of okay uh, in June, July, and the summer months. And then sometimes it could drop a bit here in this period, and then can go up a little bit just before Christmas. And then again for the Chinese New Year, it goes down. So we get an, get an uh, impression of seasonality from here. But sometimes that's not enough uh, to just look into a figure and say, okay, we have seasonality um, as we normally would like to see some statistical proofs or something like that. So that's why I use the seasonal and trend decomposition here. So uh, the STL means seasonal trend decomposition with loses. Uh, and here loses is a method that can account for nonlinearity. So here we can see the seasonal terms. Here we see for more or less every year we have kind of uh, similar pattern of seasonality. So that means that we should look into seasonality in this study. We should go for seasonal forecasting models. And then to test for nonlinearity. So interestingly, seasonality and nonlinearity has been studied in the bulk shipping context or tanker shipping context, market context, but not really in the container shipping market context. So that's why I think these are interesting to see uh, how these things work in the container shipping context. And here I use three tests. One is called Hinan's test, which was uh, published in uh, 1985. And then the next year, TSS said, actually, this test has some, some flaws, 
So TSA proposed a new test in the, in the 1986, uh, just after one year, and said that his test is better than this one. Then in 1991, the Ehler test was proposed, which argued that it is more robust than both of them. So here we see that for the first sample and second sample, both of the cases, Keenan test fails to confirm nonlinearity, but TSA test and LR test, both of them confirms nonlinearity of the time series. In all these tests, the hypotheses are slightly different, but it, it is the same thing, more or less. The null hypothesis is that there is a AR process, autoregressive process in the time series. So when the p-value is less than 0 0.05, we reject the null hypothesis and we say that there is no autoregressive process. And that means there is a non-linearity characteristic in the time series. So now from here, we see that, okay, we have seasonality, we have non-linearity. So maybe we should look for models which can account for seasonality and non-linearity, both of them. So to that, I use the ARIMA and, but actually in this paper, we use the seasonal ARIMA model, as you can see here. I'm not going to explain the equations in detail here. Um, and we have the neural network model here. So in NR means neural network autoregression. Here again, we use the seasonal neural network model, okay? And so these two models has been applied quite a lot in most many forecasting studies, but the TBETS model has not been applied in many contexts. So I'm going to spend a little bit more time here explaining the model. So the TBETS model, it's uh, T here states, trigonometric seasonal terms, B for Box-Cox transformations, uh, A for ARMA errors, and T for trend, and S for seasonal peers. Okay, so this is the meaning of TBETS model. And these are the equation to express this model. And this model was first proposed in 2011 and has not been really applied quite a lot yet. So it's still kind of fresh. So TBETS model, these are called space state space models. So that means it has some state variables. It models a system with state variables. The state space variables, they have their uh, origin in control engineering. They were established, they were uh, introduced in 1960s to process systems of co different control, control systems. Okay, so here the state variables means that it doesn't have a value of its own, but it explains a system, okay? And from the forecasting forecasting perspective, the simplest state space model may be the whole winter's model. And here, this expression is more or less similar, but it's a bit more advanced compared to whole winter's model. So here, what we see, this is actually our main equation, okay? So this is the YT, our time series of uh, container freight rate. Then we have a global trend or level, what we call, then we have a local trend, and then we have seasonal term, and then we have error, okay? But these values, what we're saying that they, each of them are state variables. And for instance here, D, D is estimated for ARMA error equation, okay? And then here, the seasonality, that comes from here, okay? In, in other uh, kind of uh, forecasting models, which are similar to uh, the halt winters, the seasonal estimation is more simpler. Here we are using the four-year seasonal terms. So it's a bit more advanced. And also we have, uh, th this equation represents the seasonality of one seasonal component. But in this model, actually, we can have multiple seasonal components within the same period. So that's also one more cool thing about this model. And again, you see the local trend is coming from here, the global trend is coming from here. Okay, so, and if we need some transformation, then it is transformed using Box-Cox transformation. So that's how the model works. I think uh, I, will, yeah, I, will, I will pass these explanations here so you can see the parameters. Only one thing uh, I will mention is that T that's model and normally their parameters are denoted in this form. And for accuracy here, I use MAPE, mean absolute percent of error and mean absolute scaled error. In mean absolute scaled error, normally if the value is less than one, we can loosely say it's better than knife forecast. It depends on what are we using in the denominator, but yeah, loosely we can say yeah, that it's if it's less than one, especially for the training sample, if it's less than one, we can say it's better than knife forecast. So which is one of the uh, thing we want. We want our forecast 
to be better than night forecast. And here, what I mean by re-estimation and, and forecast horizon, recursive horizon is that, so here, let's say we have a time series and we divide it into training sample and we divide it into test sample, okay? So what we will do, we'll use up to this data point to forecast this point. And then when we have a new data point here, we use up to this point and forecast this one. And then when we have, again, a new point here, we use up to this point and forecast this one. So that's how, that's what it is called a recursive horizon. And, or it's also known as the statistic forecast, a static, static forecast approach. So whenever we have new data available, we are incorporating in the model. So normally what we will do is, when we estimate a model using this training sample, we will be using the same parameters every time to forecast the new data point, even though we will have new information available. But when I say re-estimation, I mean that I will be re-estimating every time the model. So whenever, so I will not be using these parameters all the time. I will be always re-estimating. When there is a new data point available, I'm re-estimating the model again. Of course, with uh, uh, I, I use R package here, R software here. So with R software, I could uh, do this. Uh, still, it took a lot of time for the model. When I do re-estimation, it takes much more time to compute, but it's still, it's uh, decent. It works fine. And then here also, I did four step ahead forecast uh, just to see how the models perform uh, in one step and four step. And here are the results. So we can see that the in the first training sample, uh, in the first training sample, it's uh, the neural network model that works uh, good, but also the combination of all neural network, ARIMA and uh, TBETS, that, that works, that model is the same. But for the second training sample, we see that the TBETS model or the combination of the ARIMA neural network uh, and TBETS works the best. And Similarly, for the test sample, we see that the TBETS model or the combination of TBETS and ARIMA works the best. So that's one of the contributions that we show, okay, this TBET model actually can improve the focus performance uh, in the test period uh, in compared to other models, ARIMA or other neural network models. <coughs> and when we do the forest uh, forecasting here, we clearly see that the combination of ARIMA and TBETS is doing the best. And there are some studies. So ARIMA is still is a linear model and TBETS is a nonlinear model. So there are some studies that say that linear model, a combination of linear model and nonlinear model works very good, which we to some extent see here. And here we see the, the time series, the forecasted time series. And yeah, it's the first test sample. So training sample was much better. Uh, in, in, in test sample, we see that the forecasted time series are a bit more spread from the original, the blue one is the original one. Okay, so, so the first one was here for one week ahead and this one is for four week ahead. So we see that for, for four weeks, it's even more spread. So that normally goes with the forecasting intuition that uh, when we forecast more, for, the more further we forecast, the weaker will be our performance. And to sum up here, the key contributions are that we confirm uh, seasonality in the time series of container freight rate and then we also confirm that time series, uh, container freight rate time series is nonlinear. And uh, we also see that TBETS model has great potential in improving forecast performance, combining linear and nonlinear improves forecast performance. But re estimation does not really improve forecast performance. So this is something we normally expect that, okay, re estimating the model every time we have new data should improve the forecast performance. But in this case, it doesn't. So maybe we shouldn't really try this re-estimating every time because it, it increases computational time. Why would, you, why would we spend more time if, if it doesn't improve focus performance? And uh, focus performance becomes poor with increasing focus horizon, which we see that uh, when we are forecasting one step ahead, it does much better than when we are forecasting four step ahead. Thank you for listening. So now if you have any questions, maybe uh, we can quickly take one or two questions.